you have to think about the essence of who you want to be. Disney's essence, it's about entertainment, it's about creativity, it's about uh, the guest experience. And so I think that company out there has to figure out what is their essence, who's their audience, and what do they want to do. Welcome to the Attraction Pros Podcast, where we discuss the latest trends and challenges facing the attractions industry today. We chat with some of the top leaders in the field and provide resources that will help develop your career in this great industry. I am Josh Liebman. I am obsessed with the guest experience and helping attractions make that their top priority for success. And I'm Matt Heller. I am passionate about organizational effectiveness, leadership development, and employee engagement. Now sit upright, hold on tight, and get ready for the Attraction Pros Podcast. Hey, Matt, how's it going? It's going fantastically, Josh. How are you? Ah, doing great. Question for you. Yes, sir. How often do you maybe just shut down from work and then you jump in a plane, you head up into the sky, and then you get out of the plane and, and just start walking on the wings. How, how often do you do that? I would say I've never done that. Do you know what? <laughs> I would also say that I've never done that. But we can't say the same about our guest today who absolutely has done that. He has walked on wings. And if you're watching this on YouTube, you'll get to see a picture of him because it's his background. Um, he's done a lot of other great things, but what we spend most of our time talking about is his 30 plus years with Disney. That's right. Uh, so today we get the opportunity to chat with Dwan Rivers. Like you said, spent more than 30 years with the Walt Disney Company, worked in theme parks, hotels, cruise line, uh, it just all, all over the map, quite literally, so many departments, divisions, properties, uh, literally spanning the world. And he is just absolutely a wealth of knowledge uh, with so, so much great insight and, frankly, inspiration uh, that we get to hear about in this interview. I will say selfishly, one of the one of my favorite things that he talked about, um, and I say selfishly because this is what I do every day, is he talked about how difficult the frontline leader's job is. You've got mm. pressure from below. You've got pressure from above. You've got you know people that are serving the public that have to be um, led in a certain way. I'll just, without giving too much away of what he talked about, but I really appreciated it in all of his years of, of being an executive, how he still recognizes that that job, when you are a frontline leader is so, so difficult. And the fact that so many organizations don't put a lot of emphasis on it, um, or, or maybe not as much as they should, um, I think is a really great message. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And all of that came from talking about uh, we asked him, how how has Disney evolved over 30 plus years? You know, we've seen so many changes and, you know, we want to hear from the, the perspective from the inside of just the observations that he made to the way that that leaders interact with cast members, the way that the, the cast experience has changed, the way that the guest experience has changed uh, and, and just everything there. So we talk about that. Uh, we talk about how he says yes to opportunities, whether it's walking on the wing of a plane or running a marathon in Antarctica or skydiving from Mount Everest uh, or all of the jobs that he's taken uh, and just the, uh, the mindset of saying yes to opportunities. I, and then finally, we talk about knowing your essence. You know, we know that not everyone who is listening to this might not, they might not have the Disney budget to provide uh, what is often seen as, as the gold standard, the Disney experience. Much of the industry very much looks to Disney as uh, as just being, you know, what, what a lot of people, what a lot of attractions strive to be. And he talks about being able to deliver that caliber of experience while also tying it into what it is that you as a business are, are trying to produce and provide. So with that, is it time to say yes to this interview with Dwan? Let's do it. Let's take off, jump on the wings, and let's get straight to this interview. Yes. Hey, Dwan. Welcome to the Attraction Pros Podcast. We are so looking forward to chatting with you today. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks. Thanks. It's uh, a beautiful day in Paris, I can tell you that. <laughs> 
Well, that's good. Good to hear. It's a beautiful day here in uh, here in Chicago too, and I'm guessing probably in North <laughs> Carolina where where Matt's at too. So, uh, always good to uh, you know to connect with all different parts of the world, which is uh, which is fantastic. So, uh, Duan, to get this started here, can you tell us just a, a little, give us a, a little intro and an overview of your career? Sure. Um, you know, it's probably as indirect as any other career, I would say. So, I graduated from Emory University. I have a degree in chemistry and economics, and from the age of seven, I'm one of these kids who knew exactly what they wanted to do, and that was to become a physician. Um, and um, my junior year in college, I worked at Grady Memorial Hospital in the surgical trauma unit. And I quickly learned that dealing with burn victims, you know, gunshot wounds was not something that I could do for an extended period of time. So, you know, I was completely lost when I graduated from college, stumbling around trying to figure out what the heck I wanted to do. And for me, um, I worked part time at the Marriott Marquis in Atlanta just to make ends meet. And uh, I was getting my investment license at a local investment firm. Stock market crashed. That job ended. But nonetheless, I got lucky one night because I was checking in a Disney recruiter who was going to some school for the college program. I started discussing my high school days. I worked on Main Street and he was like, you should really come back and work for Disney. So that Christmas, I uh, uh, convinced my stepmom to slide my resume into the vice president of uh, resorts inbox and had a conversation with the guy. He uh, he said, you know what? We need people like you. So 17 interviews later in five months, I started working with the Disney company on an entry level role at the Grand Floridian Beach Resort running uh, Bell Services and Valet. And so my career was like really like three big chunks. The first one was just kind of matriculating up to my first executive role all throughout resorts. I opened up, you know, six hotels in, in Florida, three in, in Disneyland Paris, general manager of Wilderness Lodge. And then I'd say the next portion of my career was all about exploring and having opportunities on the executive front. So I moved over the cruise line, did some call center work, um, went back to hotels for a second, then moved over to Disney Springs where I got promoted to a VP. And then that really sort of launched the, the final half of my career where I thought was probably the most exciting. And I guess some international business development work. I had a chance to go work in Hawaii for a few years, then off to Paris. And then finally, Disney's Animal Kingdom, which is where I retired uh, just over a year ago now. Wow, yeah. Awesome. So I guess the lesson there, Dwan, is you can't hold a job. Yeah, exactly. I'm trying to tell people that. You just cannot hold a job. Sometimes, you know, I, you know, I think for me, I always tell people, go with your weaknesses. So my weakness was lack of focus. To your point, I really loved everything. And I came on to Disney when it was tremendous growth. So whenever there was an opportunity, I'm like, I'll do it. I'll do it. So that was, it actually played in my favor to be uh, a little less focused. No, I think it's great that you had all that that breadth of experience. And one of the things I'm curious about is it's all within the Walt Disney Company, but so many different lines of business, so many different facets. I mean, the cruise line and resorts. What were some of the maybe the similarities that you saw across those different lines? And also maybe what were some of the things that you found to be interesting that were different? Yeah, I think... You know, not knowing about the, this whole business from an academic standpoint, it was completely open for me. So I was completely surprised at how similar the operations work, at least from a management standpoint. Whether you're running a call center or operating a hotel or running a theme park, there are just some simple things that leaders do. They motivate cast members. They dig into their business. They understand what the, the guest component is by listening to our guests. And so I think the most shocking thing was just like how symbiotic and how similar they were. And I think a lot of people tend to be hesitant about jumping to different lines of business. They're comfortable with resorts. They know how to run a hotel. So the idea of jumping on a cruise ship or going into a theme park or water park may, to, may feel like it's a little unstable. But in fact, they sort of build that sort of basic leadership uh, component and they, can, and they can move on. And then just how, from a guest perspective, the guest sees us as, at least from a Disney standpoint, one company. I mean, literally, 
They don't care if you're a hotel. They don't care if you're a park. They don't care if you're uh, 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 a cruise ship. They're going to come to you about solving their Disney problem. And in the beginning, I was all about, I'm a hotel guy. Yeah. I don't, I don't know anything about a theme park. But what you find out is that the guest expectation is that you know a little bit about everything. You know, I've got to imagine, too, that I, for a company the size of Disney that just spans so much geography of being able to create that consistency in the processes, in the guest experience, in the cast experience, I, it's got, probably got to be extremely complex to be able to, to duplicate that, you know, across so many places. I, it, you know, and, and I'm curious from your perspective of going from one property to the next, I can imagine that part of that is there's the responsibility of, of bringing that uh, of what you've seen from other properties to these other locations, while at the same time, probably learning too, perhaps about uh, about the culture of this part of the organization and kind of noticing maybe there are differences and some similarities, but also managing that consistency as well. And, you know, I've got to imagine that the, you know, the front desk staff at Alani doesn't talk mm -hmm. to the custodial staff at Disneyland Paris, or at least not very often. <laughs> exactly. So you're kind of that, that thread to be able to, to get them through. Can you talk a little bit of sort of what, what that was like of really managing that consistency while at the same time kind of acknowledging perhaps differences that needed to be maintained? Yeah, I think another big surprise for me was as I moved from business to business to business, you realize that there are two layers. One is that no matter how good the business is running and no matter how good the previous leader was, there is still growth and opportunity in that business. So meaning, for instance, Josh Damaro, who's our chairman of the Walt Disney Company now, was the guy who I took over from, from Disney's Animal Kingdom. Great reputation, blah, blah, blah. But even with someone of that caliber, there's still opportunity for a leader to sort of put their, their stamp on the, on the experience. So first, I don't believe that you change things for the sake of changing. I think you move into an operation, you sort of understand it. You really do a lot of analysis, talking to the people, quickly coming up to speed with sort of what, what are the guests saying about this particular business? And believe it or not, you'll find out that, oh my God, I solved this same problem when I was working on Cruise Line. I know how to solve this. It, it's, it, may, it may sound uh, like it's a different business, a floating hotel bus versus a, a static hotel, but in fact, it's a hotel. You know, guests are checking in, guests are checking out, and you, you can learn from that. Um, solving a guest uh, challenge. And the thing I learned most about a theme park, theme parks are just awesome. Note to self, if you want a great job, run a theme park. <laughs> uh, you know, with a hotel, if the guest has a, a challenge, they come back and see you every day, every day, all day, they come back and see you. But in a the theme park, they're great. I mean, I, I used to look for issues. I'm like, I want to go solve that problem. But what you can actually do is you can help each other out. We... When I started at Disney, theme parks were over here, resorts were over there. There wasn't a lot of communication. You would think there was, you know, they, they, were, they were intricately connected, but in fact, they were like very different. I think over time, we've, we've figured out that, you know, you can work together and help sort of solve these issues or get ahead of the experience and make sure that um, um, either from a technology standpoint or not, that the guest experience is from end to end. That's it truly is from the time they pick up that phone and they're making a decision to come and stay at your overall destination that they are connected until they leave. And uh, um, I, I, you don't sort of, at least for me, I didn't realize that until I actually started moving from location to location. And I always encourage people, even if you love resorts, if that's your career of destination, go do something else. You need to go understand how your skill set can be sort of transferred to something else and then what new things you can learn to bring back to your business. Because when you're so 
sort of tunnel focus on delivering one type of experience, sometimes you can forget that there are other ways to solve that same challenge. Um, you know, if you're a freestanding hotel in Marriott, you have a whole different set of issues than if you're on a campus like Disney. And so solving our campus-wide problems, um, it's something I think is uh, necessary, number one, but in order to do that, uh, having those sort of very diverse experiences uh, tend to help you in the long run. I would totally agree. I know that I feel like where I am in my career is really the culmination of everything I've done, right? So operations and human resources and, and all these different things. So um, getting those different experiences, I think, is really valuable. Um, and that kind of leads me to a question that I want to kind of take a couple of steps back here just for a second and talking about your your education through college and, you know, that that job where you, you couldn't deal with burn victims and, and, and gunshot wounds. I'm curious, though, what what that taught you that you're still using maybe even now or you use through your <clears throat> career um, that really helped you and how you applied some of that, even though you weren't, you know, bandaging people up? Sure. You know, first, I think from an academic standpoint, um, majoring in economics was very helpful. I get to see news reports and I listen and read newspapers, televisions, and I understand that sort of what's happening in Europe will ultimately have an impact to, in, in the U.S. So if there is an exchange rate issue, the dollar, for instance, now, even from the time I arrived in, in, in Europe uh, a year and a half ago, the exchange rate was 0.8 to the dollar. And now we're on parity. So that, 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 that has an impact on us. That has an impact on the guests that you're dealing with, their mindset, how they're thinking about it. Um, you know, working in the surgical trauma unit at Grady Hospital was mind blowing. But what it taught me was that when people have problems, they really want people to listen to them and not hear them, but really listen to them um, and, and, and try and understand sort of like, how do I get from point A to point B? And then I think that experience also taught me that, you know, in one day you can be talking to a, uh, you know, the, uh, a manager of a company or a director of a company who came in because he was in an accident, or you'd be talking to a homeless person, or you could be talking to a mother or a child and how to interact and deal with different personalities under stress and duration. I think what's very helpful, uh, uh, especially on the front line of a front desk. I mean, I used to think, oh my God, this is, I can solve that problem. I mean, what could be worse than trying to deal with someone who just lost both their legs in a railroad accident? I mean, our, our, our issues are not sort of life ending. Our issues are how do you make it bigger and better and, and improve that experience? But understanding that every single person in front of you is different and where I think a company like Disney, and especially the bigger you have and the more guests you have, you tend to you tend to try and solve issues as a as a whole. And I think you put you put policies and procedures in, in place to guide big businesses in their directions. But when you're actually solving a guest problem, you need to solve those individually and not sort of as a group. Mm. Yeah, no, that's that's really fascinating. Thank you, thank you for sharing that. Uh, mm -hmm. One thing we're curious about too is just with your time with Disney, with with three decades with the Walt Disney <laughs> Company, yeah. I, it, there were definitely some changes and and some evolution of the organization during that time. And curious as far as just you know your observations, and you know even just in in the last few years, we've seen just some massive shifts that I don't think a lot of people expected to see from the the you know wardrobe and grooming guidelines, you know, completely being being overhauled. You know, that's that's certainly one thing. Obviously, in in the interest of adding the fifth key of inclusion and and all of that. Uh, but curious from, from your lens, uh, as far yeah. as you know, what you observed over, over 30 years with the company. Yeah. You know, you guys are, I mean, you never really comprehend the amount of time you spend at the company, but you know, we'll be celebrating our hundredth anniversary. Disney will be celebrating its hundredth anniversary, I believe next year. 
And I spent 33 years of that 100 years, which is mind boggling to think that I was on a relatively large percentage of, of that time. But if I go back just the amount of time that I was there from a product standpoint, imagine when I started 33 years ago, we just, you know, there was domestic parks, California here and Tokyo Disneyland. We had a couple of thousand hotel rooms. Um, the film industry was, you know, Disney films. And now you have like 50,000 hotel rooms, you have six destinations, you have, you know, everything you can possibly imagine that means um, from a guest experience standpoint, cruise ships, travel companies, homes and residences now. So the product has evolved uh, tremendously over that time. Um, also, from a guest perspective, the guest needs and wants um, those needs and wants have also sort of evolved over time. I remember when I worked at the Disney Call Center, we, you know, we, got, we, we went through this massive sort of overhaul of how we interacted with our guests. Because really, up till then, it was build and they will come. You know, the, you know, the operators would just answer phones and book reservations. But then as obviously more competition uh, moved into the area. And I'm not talking just about other theme parks, but you know, massive other opportunities around the world. Disney had to become a lot more competitive and, and, uh, and to learn a lot more about their guests through CRM studies and things of that nature. So I've seen the guest expectation evolve from sort of passive to being very, very active in what they want. The guest, uh, a few years ago, not even that long ago, a few years ago would, would have to go up to a cast room and go, well, how long the wait is it at Magic at the yeah, at Big Thunder Mountain? Now, within a half a millisecond, they can go to their phone, determine you know, the, the, the amount of time they have to wait. They can book a reservation. They can go eat. They can, they're far more active and not passive in the experience. And they are able to sort of control it as much as they, they, they possibly can. And of course, that's a a positive and a, and a negative. If, if this is your first time visitor and you've never understood the technology, then you know, you're going to have a bit of a challenge and that's where the cash member comes who has to be very sensitive to that person who doesn't know anything about it. But if you're savvy, I mean, you, you, you get to really be in the driver's seat of your sort of experience. And then on the cast side, like you said, the evolution. I mean, when I started, we still had height, weight guidelines. You were coming this is impossible to even wrap your head around, but you would come in and ask and off an interview for a job. And I would go, Oh, this person is okay. And then I would say, stand on a scale and I get a height measurement. And if you were not in the right height weight ratio, you were not given a job on stage. So we put you what we call off stage. And so on stage, off stage had like multiple, we use it more from a cultural standpoint, but, now but back then it was like so i can't even but it was all about the show your character you know you wouldn't have a you wouldn't have a um, a, a person who was very short playing a, a character role that was very tall or a person that was um very large playing a role of a person that was very skinny or small so we we made ourselves believe that our cast members had to fit that role Fast forward, I remember doing the Alani project and oh my, the pushback that we initially received from the community about not having tattoos because it was a cultural representation. And I, I mean, I remember sitting through one of the uh, televised community um, sessions that I used to go on and do uh, updates. And it was unbelievable the amount of comments and engagement I had about that. Fast forward, now you have tattoos, you can wear earrings, there's uh, uh, the hair. Uh, uh, I mean, so, so many things have changed. And I think, you know, you look back and, you, and people go, oh, Walt will be turning over in his grave. I don't know. Walt probably have an earring by now. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> uh, <laughs> like Joe Rody or something. But so, because I think um, 
we, we, we often judge ourselves based on past memories and not realizing that everything has evolved at the same, at the same pace and same time. So cast members' expectations have changed, uh, what they want to do, what they want to say, who they want to be and how they want to be recognized. Um, those things have all changed. And so management and human resources are trying to just keep up with that because you're, you're trying to live this legacy lifestyle while also recognizing that the world is changing. And if you don't change your, you know, if you don't change with that, then, you know, who's going to work, who's going to deliver the service, who's going to engage with our, our guests. Yeah. Well, Dewan, it's really interesting how you made the parallel between the guest and the, the cast member experience, because that's one thing that Josh and I talk a lot about is we're all human beings, right? And so, as businesses evolve, as experiences evolve, you, you just said it, you know, management has to evolve. Sometimes it feels like we're just trying to keep up um, with guests or team members or cast members. And I think that's a really important point to think about both of those in parallel and how you how you kind of navigate all those different um, uh, all those different changes over the years. Um, one of the things I'm really curious about is the fact that especially when it comes to experiences and even to to some degree you know cast members and how they how they interact with people that disney really is the gold standard and so many people look to disney and say oh disney's allowing tattoos now i can allow tattoos you know what i mean and and things like that so i'm curious from your standpoint having worked in the organization for so long and think about a, a family entertainment center in you know iowa and they're trying to elevate their experience and they see Disney as this gold standard, but they know they don't have the Disney budget. They don't have the Disney resources, but they may have the mindset to do it. So what would they need in their mindset to create a, a Disney experience or that elevated experience wherever they are and even maybe across businesses when they don't have the, the Disney resources or, 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 um, or budget? Sure. You know, Disney is known for spending big bucks. So I mean, it's we. I have lots of conversations about that. But all that aside, I think that if you're in if you're in Ohio and you have a uh, whatever type of uh, experience, uh, park experience, you wanna you wanna create this um, Disney like um, um, experience for for your guests. I think the first thing you have to say is. All right, get rid of all of the fluff around Disney. You know, strip everything away. And what is the, I talk, you know, one of the things that as I think about, uh, one of the things I'm thinking about doing in the future is trying to put a lot of this in, in words and book or something like that. But one of the things that I, I've been mulling around is, you know, you have to think about the essence of who you want to be. Disney's essence, it's about entertainment it's about creativity it's about uh, the guest experience and so i think that company out there has to figure out what is their essence who's their audience and what do they want to do mm-hmm. and so once they've sort of sort of mapped all that out then i think it's important to figure out what's what's the competitive environment um, that's around them and then you know the cool thing about technology is that you can you can buy off the shelf pretty cool experiences out there I and mean, they're not shrouded in all the theming that we have but you can buy some pretty cool experiences already but the difference is the difference will be the employee cast member team member to guest experience um what seems to be very simple to know is it seems to be very difficult to execute having great guest service and great guest interaction is a no-brainer but trying to execute that is very difficult and believe it or not i hate to say this but they don't even have to be excellent at it they just have to be good at it because so many other places are not even good they're really bad So we used to say you have to, you know, if you don't have the money to be excellent, you know, don't don't try and spend so you get diminishing return. Disney, with its budgets, we can get diminishing return. I can keep investing, investing, investing. And once I get 80%, I'm only going to gain, let's say, 2% increments after every big investment. 
Whereas, whereas I was getting 20% on that investment. And then afterwards I started getting diminishing return. That company out there may just have to stop at the point where they start getting diminishing returns and say, okay, it may not be worth the extra $100,000 to get the next 5%. Let me stop here. But you got to make sure that what you've put in place is solid and that the, the, the team member, the cash member, it has really grounded themselves and understand the, their purpose. Like, why are they there? Um, I learned this really cool thing in Hawaii about Kuleana and about your responsibility. Like, like, what is your purpose? And so I think you have to be able to instill in every sort of employee, like their purpose. And Disney is great at that. You know, when I started Disney, there we had three days of traditions. Can you believe it? Three days. So you were grounded in the culture, you were grounded in, but now you're, I think traditions is a half a day and the other half is in the location. So you have to spend a lot more money educating the leaders on how to on the job train sort of that cultural introduction and lead by example and showcase and, you know, we spent a lot of time talking about grooming guidelines and all those things that are not necessary, that we're not, you know, we're looking at it from a different perspective. So I think you reinvest that time now into really grounding people into uh, the, the essence, their, their purpose. If it's a family destination, maybe a family destination. If it's a place for teenagers to hang out, what do teenagers want? Figure that part out. Um, making sure that safety, no matter what, is always number one and you're never compromising. But I think those those smaller companies need to make sure they nail it with the cast member and guest interaction. And then they need to, you know, sort of train up into maybe diminishing returns. And, you know, I hate saying anything less than 100 percent, but in reality, not everyone can afford 100 percent, to be frank. Um, and then I think. Um, they have to spend a lot of time listening to their guests. So what does the guest really want? And because social media now, one person can sound like the voice of 500. You have to be really sort of careful on how you sort of sort through that. But in reality, you, you need to be able to figure out what's really important to that guest and then sort through that experience and prioritize it, um, nail your experiences and then build upon that. Um, I think sometimes companies try and do too much too soon. And if you try and do too much too soon without the right resources, you're gonna collapse on yourself. And I'm not saying take forever, you know, you can build aggressively fast, but in a very sort of uh, methodical way. Um, but I do think that uh, uh, understanding what the guest experience is like is super important. And then I don't think you can divorce, you said, or said this earlier, the guest experience and the cast experience. As you're hiring people from the community, those local areas, like why would a why would a kid go work in you know a fast food place down the street versus come here? Or what are those differences? And once you sort of figure that out and put it as a bundle, uh, then I think they can move forward and create sort of these what we call the magical experience. It's their magic, obviously, uh, but I believe they can they can do it easily. Yeah. So this is really interesting. And, and what I find really fascinating is you, you really talk about the, the economics of building a service culture and building a company culture. You know, you talk about, you said, yeah, Disney has the resources to spend the big bucks on doing it. Uh, and you talk about the importance of recognizing where the diminishing returns are. Uh, if they are looking to make that investment, whatever that investment is, and, and even knowing when to stop, what is that investment? Where where does that money go to? Is it towards training employees? If so, what type of training is it? Is it towards incentive programs? What you know? Where do you invest into creating whether it's that Disney like experience or knowing the essence of who you are of saying this is our identity and this is where we need to focus our money towards? Yeah, I think that um, in today's in in today's world, you can get away with a lot of training, especially with the if, let's just say this new place in Ohio is going to attract younger employees. Younger employees are awesome at technology. You know, it's not like you're trying to create an experience in South Florida on the West coast where the majority of people are older and you may have older people working there who may not be as astute with work, 
working some of the technology. And so I think technology-based engagement is, and the study of that, a little studying up front will be very helpful because you can get away probably with training people with not a lot of money and then reinforcing it with your leadership uh, engagement and ensuring that what you read and what you saw and what you saw that was funny and engaging in the games that you played to understand what you did is what we want to convey. And so I think there's a way of reducing some of that training, at least at least for some of that population by using uh, technology. Um, and also think that uh, the reward system is super important. And so whatever you reward, you will get. And that's very important. And every reward has both a bright side and a not so bright side or a positive side and a side that could be negative. So for instance, if you recognize people and you reward people for selling the most and you don't have a way of countering that, people may do whatever it takes to sell, including not maybe always on board or above board. So I think that understanding your, your reward system and making sure that it's balanced is gonna be super important. And reward systems, if you understand what your uh, cast member base, your team member base really, really prefer, then you can, a little work up front will help you not uh, just give out generic stuff. We tend to just give out generic stuff. I'm gonna give everybody a water bottle. I have so many water bottles. I don't need another water bottle. <laughs> so, but what is it that will, uh, that people are saying in the community and with their employees? In some cases, like now, you know what? We're gonna give away gas cards. I'm gonna give you free gas. I mean, like people will be like, wow, do whatever it takes for that. Um, so I do think a little, little work up front to understand what are the motivators uh, for those individuals uh, will, be, uh, will be important. And you can do that simply like what we said earlier, um, you may look at, you may look at uh, high schools or you may, you may look at sporting events and you may look at um, um, the televisions that they're watching and see what is it that these, that these people are, are, are being motivated, motivated by? I mean, how, why, why are they getting excited? And, uh, and sometimes you realize it's, not even a material thing. They just want you as a leader to listen to them and make the environment fun. When you're young, you just want to be, just want to have, you, you want the workplace to be enjoyable. You want, you want, when you have to leave home and go there, because who knows what people's home life is like, but when they go there, that they have a, a rich, diverse experience with you, know, where they can see themselves, whoever they are. Um, you know, matriculating through that environment and, and having the right amount of challenges and being sort of very transparent about the experience and what they can expect. And, and uh, I think, yeah, I think they'll find out that they can be more uh, uh, successful than what they might uh, give themselves credit for. And uh, it's for the long term too. So that business hopefully is planning on being there for 50 years, a hundred years. And, and so they need to, also understand that it's going to evolve. That's the worst thing. You create a program and they walk away from it. Three years later, they come back and they wonder why it's not working. Well, yeah. Yeah. things have changed. <laughs> yeah. Or, or you have limited success at the beginning and you think, oh, it's broken. It, you know, the, the program is not working. The kids don't like it, you know, and, you, and right. then you abandon it and, and you wonder why things aren't, aren't working. Um, there's, there's quite a few things in there that I wanted to touch on, but one of them specifically that I'll, I'll mention is you talked about the reward system. And I love the fact that you say, you know, you've got to have kind of the backup for it, right? You know, if, if there's a sales program, you, you've got to have the parameters so people don't abuse it. Um, I also think, at least this has been my experience, that if you have a program that recognizes sales, you also have to have programs that recognize other things for people who aren't in sales, right? And that's a that's a big thing, a big miss, I think, when when people are putting together those kind of programs. But then, you know, later in your in your comment, um, you talked about what you reward will get done. 
And absolutely, you know, what you reward, what you uh, train people to do, what you value are the things that are going to get done. So my curiosity uh, from that in, again, spanning your career is Mm -hmm. how have you found that maybe cast members have changed over the years or are people people and the times change more than the people have changed? Good question. Um, I think that times have definitely changed. Um, I think people tend to feel like, at least my observation, is that they have a bigger voice these days. So back in the day, I think cast members were like, oh my God, I need this job. The big boss, the man in control has complete say-so over me. They have their thumb on me. Um, And now I think uh, uh, cast members are the exact same cast members. It's just that they're no longer being suppressed. They're no longer, their voice is no longer um, is being held back. And then they have multiple ways. I mean, I cannot imagine when I started at Disney, if I didn't like something my boss said that I would go on, I would go on Facebook and write this note about him, you know, but so people have the ability to, to articulate uh, how they feel and, and, uh, um, um, and the environment uh, much more today than they did uh, before. So I think people, people are people, um, the, the definitely the times have changed. I think the savviness of leaders is definitely has to be sort of uh, pushed to another layer. I think those entry level leaders, the leaders that are dealing directly with the frontline cast have the most challenging job period. Um, and we tend to spend the least amount on their uh, development. Um, and so I think companies really need to reevaluate, like what do they want their, their employees to do and learn and incentivize? And then how are you teaching that frontline leadership to deliver that? Um, as a vice president, my direct reports, not that I would ever do this, but I don't have to be so nice. I could be far more direct. I could be uh, less, uh, I, don't, I don't have to pander around things. I could, I mean, they're getting paid and I could give them sort of direction. Obviously I'm gonna do it in a very human, human way, but that frontline cast member has, you know, 40 different employees. I had, I had 12 direct reports. Frontline cast members has 40 direct reports. Each one of those individuals are very, very, very different. And they have to be uh, savvy enough to be able to, to motivate them as a group, but also sort of motivate them individually and understand where the sort of 90% of these people that are salvageable and you can push and do and motivate and the 10% that, you know, that are, you just can't change, you know, or maybe hopefully it's less than 10%, hopefully it's like 2%, but and there's a there's a percent in every workforce that you know the, that you probably can't spend a lot of time on because you're not going to help them. You got to help them. The time that you spend with them, you need to help them figure out where will their experience be best if it's not uh, if it's not there. And you know, don't necessarily stay here and just uh, be unproductive. That's such great advice, insights right there that, uh, you know, I, I think everyone listening to this, that that they can apply that, you know, directly to their leadership style and and really just the, the mindset and the mentality. And you talk about those who are, you know, overseeing the front line that, yeah, they they do probably have it the most difficult. They're, they're pulled in a lot of different directions um, and getting a lot of a lot of pressure from, you know, those, those below them and those, you know, and those above them. So uh, th- thanks so much for, for sharing that. So we, uh, we still have a few minutes left here and uh, a couple more questions for you. And um, mm-hmm. curious, what do you see as being uh, one of, or the most rewarding moment of your career and why? Mm. I just, wow, I had so many cool things that happened to me, but I think, the Alani project uh, that I worked on in Hawaii, it, it rules uh, as the number one sort of experience that I had because, um, you know, I spent four years in Hawaii. Who wouldn't love that? But, um, you know, the first year and a half, 
I was there by myself. I was the only Disney sort of cast member on the island. And so I literally started the business from my hotel, from my hotel room. I found a, an office space. I built my team. Um, we were there from the beginning as we met with the, sort of the, the cultural teams, the, the governmental bodies, the, uh, the WDI and the construction team people with leadership would fly in and fly out. But I was sort of like a stable guy on the, on the road. And um, if you know anything about Hawaii, I mean, you, there's a superficial area, uh, sort of appearance of Hawaii, but then there's a secondary one where this cultural component is super important. And people held us to a really, really sort of high standard. And um, I think being able to, uh, and this story can go on forever, but I won't, but being able to overcome all of those stumbling blocks that we faced in the beginning and to create the project that we have now that is literally embraced by both the community and sort of the, the company itself and it's a financial success. Um, I think uh, works for me uh, out of all the experiences that I had has to be the, the number one. That's very cool. Very cool. So that was uh, over and above you, you getting your name on main street then. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, technically I got my name on main street after my retirement date. So. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the main street thing was, um, you know, I worked there, as I said, I worked there in high school in the confectionery shop and um, my younger self, if I would have walked out the front door of where I worked and looked over to the left, it's where my window sits now. So when you're a Disney cast member, especially when we had three days of traditions and you get, it, it, it was ingrained in your head that these names were people that made such an impact on the, uh, on the company. And uh, uh, frankly, I'll be completely honest. When I was that younger kid, I thought you had to be a, a, a dead white guy to get up there. I mean, like I, I didn't know how you could actually, how that even happened. But, you know, after, after, as I'm matriculated sort of through my 30 years, you recognize the importance that each one of these, these people, and they were real people with real backgrounds and amazing stories. So to share that window with the three other guys that uh, are on there, um, was really mind blowing. It was a phenomenal experience, and um, it's like the legacy war times ten. You know, it's like a, it's a, it's a pretty 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 cool capstone on your career um, for for a person who grew up on the parks and resort side. Can you actually just give a little context for those who, who might be listening or watching to this who, who don't really know uh, what it actually means? I, I remember going through traditions when I worked at Disney in college and I remember taking the tour down Main Street and they said, these are these are the credits. These are you know, the, the people who who made it come to life. So can you actually just add like some some explanatory context of just what it means in general of, of all of those names on Main Street? Yeah. So if you're walking down Main Street, you should look up and you'll see these windows, basically storefront windows windows and on the storefront windows you'll see names etched and next to their name it will say that they were uh, they contributed in a very special way mine was international operations um, but what it means is that the the company um, has selected you as a representation of what it means to have the ultimate level of commitment dedication and contribution to the overall success uh, of the company in that in that business. So there are people, um, you know, Card Walker, Dick Nunes, Meg Croft, and you have all these names that have had huge, huge contributions for the company uh, since you know um, Disneyland was open, basically in California. That's so cool. And next time I go um, to, to Disney World, I'm going to look for that so I can, yeah. I can say, I, I know that guy. Um, <laughs> where is it? Where, where on Main Street? So if you're walking down Main Street towards the castle, the first building that you see is the first half of the Emporium. The second building you see is the second half of the Emporium. Well, as you're getting to the second building of the Emporium, you look directly up and you'll see it. Uh, you'll see it there. 
Awesome. awesome. Cool. Cool. And for anybody watching and listening, go go watch, go look for yes. it. Take a selfie in front of it. Let us know you saw it. <laughs> send, me, um, send me send me a copy of it. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Um, well, Dewan, as as uh, Josh mentioned, we're kind of kind of uh, getting to the end, unfortunately, of this interview. But um, I want to talk a little bit about kind of what's happened since retirement. You've been traveling the world. Uh, for anybody who's watching the YouTube video, you see the wing walker behind, uh, behind Dewan. That is him <laughs> on the wing walker. Um, so tell us a little bit about your adventures since uh, since retiring. Yeah, so people often ask me, why did you retire when you did? And for me, it's like, right now, I'm physically fit enough to do some of the more strenuous things I want to do. And uh, I want to take the pressure off, off off Disney. I had the best job in the world and I loved it. But I love putting myself in situations like learning how to walk on a wing of a plane, um, running a marathon in, uh, in the Antarctica. Um, I was the first part of the first people in the world that ever skydived. We did a halo skydive over Mount Everest. So we jumped out of a plane at 30,000 feet and flew over the face of Mount Everest and landed. So I'm always looking for the next cool opportunity. Um, I'm headed to Peru um, in a couple of weeks to do the Sky Lodge. It's a blast tube they've attached to a cliff that's a thousand feet up. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go, and, uh, go and do that. But the one thing left on my bucket list that, you know, I just have to wait till it materializes. I still want to do this space. So I'm going to, I'm definitely, uh, uh, I got my little piggy bank. So I'm already, I, I, it's already <laughs> I'm ready to go with that. But yeah, I definitely want to do one of the, the, the space programs, whichever one does the, the best one. But, you know, working in Animal Kingdom um, uh, gave me this huge connection to the environment and animals. So I love uh, going on safari and there's a place in Borneo that I want to check out and caves in Vietnam. So whatever I can squeeze in, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm definitely going to do, but the bucket, bucket, bucket list is uh, probably one of the space programs. How can, I'm trying to formulate this question. The only way I can think of it is like, how can we all be more like you? But I'm trying to <laughs> make, it, make it more succinct here is I, it, how can we all maybe like live with that mindset. If you said, I'm, I'm always trying to look for the next cool opportunity, like walking yeah. on the wing of a plane, most people will be like, oh, like that sounds like it would be cool to do. But then maybe like bridging aspiration with action is probably like maybe where I'm, where I think maybe this question can go here. <laughs> um, well, definitely, I think it's a, it's a mindset. And then we don't have time for this story, but <laughs> I started off as a courier when I, worked at the Grand Floridian. So on my days off, I would take packages to different remote places around the world. And I had to travel by myself. I would go to an airport and they would say, oh, your assignment is Bolivia. Here's a one-way ticket, drop this thing off. And then you have two weeks off to do whatever you want to do. So I didn't even know that thing existed and I figured it out. And I traveled the world for like 15 years to all these remote places. And then I got to the point where that was a foundation. And then I went, well, what's next? And then my a good buddy of mine called and said, hey, let's go climb Kilimanjaro. I go, why would I ever do that? But we climbed Kilimanjaro. And we, after we did that, we were like, oh, well, we can do the seven summits. So then we decided to go climb the seven highest peaks. And then, so it's, it's a stacking thing. So I think it's, you do your, even if it's just basic travel, just get out and see the world. And, and it, what seems to be so improbable is definitely possible, but you got to do it. And you realize, hey, it's not so bad. Uh, I did that. And then you do the next step. But, you know, no matter what I've done, I've always put safety first. People go like, I can't believe you've done that. But I'm like, I would not do that if I didn't think it was safe. They think that's <laughs> ironic, but I, I, tr I truly do uh, believe that uh, I have to check out the safety aspect of it first. And then it's just being physically conditioning yourself, you know, eating right, staying physically healthy so that when an opportunity comes, you can, you can sort of uh, take advantage of it. But uh, uh, you can read many books now that says, and my boss actually gave me this book. I think he was trying to tell me something. So, <laughs> you know, you're more productive when you say no. You know, so you like, you got to say no sometimes to be more productive. I've always said yes to just about every opportunity. Um, all those work experiences were not always, uh, most of those things in now sound glamorous, 
But when they were offered to me, no one else wanted them. They were like, I'm not going to go live on a cruise ship away from my family for four months at a time or six months. And, you know, I did it. You know, transitioning the call center was very challenging. But so I think if you're in a mindset of, of, of creating opportunities for yourself, then that just transitions to the next level, the next level, the next level. And then you're walking on a, the wing of a plane or flying in <laughs> a spaceship. To move. That's awesome. That's awesome. I love the the conversation about mindset and and looking for the next opportunity. So thank you very much for sharing that, Duan. Um, and we're kind of we're kind of uh, wrapping this up. If people wanted to uh, learn a little bit more about you or get in touch, where would where would you send them? Um, probably my Instagram uh, is Duan World Traveler. Um, so that's probably the easiest way. D J U A N World Traveler. Um, I'm on Facebook. I don't use LinkedIn that often. I actually have not uh, updated, but I will be uh, updating that and um, doing some other work later on this year. So I'll come back to you guys once that's all up and ready to go. But uh, thank you. Absolutely. Excellent. Uh, Duan, this has been a, just such a, a phenomenal interview. We really appreciate the conversation today. So thank you so much for uh, for your time, uh, sharing some of your time with us. Uh, and for everyone out there who is watching and listening, just remember, we are all attraction pros. Thanks for listening to the Attraction Pros Podcast. Make sure to subscribe so you can tune in when new episodes release. And even better, please leave us a review on iTunes. For more information, visit attractionpros.com.